Nathan Ballengrude is a 1989 graduate of Asheville High School who didn't find himself as a writer until his mid-30s. Today, he's a venerated dark fantasy novelist with two collections of short stories and a novel adapted into a movie. His new novel, titled The Strange, is set almost a century ago, but in a world, or I should say worlds, we can only envision. The Strange also derives from my love of old science fiction, old pulp. It draws heavily from Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, Isaac Asimov's I, Robot, Frank Herbert's Dune, Westerns. I've come to this point where I just feel much more comfortable just throwing in everything I love and letting it become what it wants to be. I'm Matt Pikin, and this is The Overlook, a daily podcast about the news, arts, issues, and trends of Asheville, North Carolina. My guest today, Nathan Ballengrude, talks about his path to writing, setting the futuristic elements of the strange in our familiar past, and how an author in his 50s took on the vantage and voice of a teenaged girl as the book's central character. You already know, The Overlook brings you stories and voices from across the city. Now we also bring you First Look. It's a new daily newsletter that brings you the news headlines from all over Asheville. You can scan it at a glance and see if there's something you've missed or just need to know more about. No ads disguised as stories, just the headlines in a quick, easy read. Get the First Look newsletter for free at podavl.com newsletter. I began our conversation by asking Nathan Ballengrude where he was in his writing career when he moved from New Orleans back to Asheville in the early 2000s. Just beginning. I sold my first professional story in the early 90s, but I didn't really pursue it at the time. I don't think I I really started, really felt comfortable as a writer until around 2002 or 3 when I sold what I considered to be the first story of the real me. What was that? It was called You Go Where It Takes You. Describe that story, and where did you sell it? I sold it to a website, now defunct, called sci-fi.com. It was, I believe, related to the Sci-Fi Channel. And it was about a a woman who lives in in, in the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. She's a single mom. She has a difficult child. And, and she meets somebody at the diner she works in. Who, she takes him home for a kind of a one-night stand. And he turns out to be somebody who's able to shift out of his skins into new ones and assume new identities. And she wants, she's completely captivated by the potentials this provides and wants him to take her with him. And he won't. And it's about the choice she makes after that rejection. You sold your first story in the 90s, but it wasn't until the early 2000s that you got serious about it, right? Yeah. So were you pursuing a writing career or was your mind in other places about what you thought you were going to do in life? I wasn't pursuing a writing career. I always knew that I would come back to it. Throughout my 20s, I knew that it was... It was there, and it was going to be where I would end up. But for those years, I didn't, I didn't do anything, really, as far as writing goes. I was trying to gather some life experience. I was just smart enough in my early 20s to know I didn't know anything at all. I didn't know about people, didn't know about myself, didn't know about the world. And so I didn't think anything I'd have to say would be worth reading. That's so. interesting. So you knew, you said you knew you would end up as a writer. Yeah. That was in your head. But you also said you had the wherewithal to know you didn't know anything. Yeah. Did you go out and see the world, as you put it, to give yourself the perspective and the information from which to write from? It wasn't that conscious a choice. It was more like, at the time, I thought, well, I'm just not ready for this. I was with a friend of mine, and I was reading, I was sitting on his couch. We were both young, trying to be, thinking of ourselves as writers. And I had read a story sitting on his couch called A Day's Wait by Ernest Hemingway. Two pages, three pages perhaps. Not one of his more famous stories. But it just left a crater in me. I couldn't believe how much power and emotion he was able to convey. And then I thought about the, this little thing that I had just written. And I was like, no, I'm not ready. How no. did you know you weren't ready? It's one thing to want to be a writer. It's another to be self-critical and self-analytical about it. Did you have anybody who made you think you could also write was there were there writers who you thought i want to do that kind of work yeah for sure beforehand growing up it was very surface level it was all about story and narrative propulsion that kind of thing writers like stephen king and rice did uh, you say narrative propulsion yeah okay what do you mean by that 
Just the just getting caught up in the story and in the plot and having to know what happens next. This kind of compulsion to keep on going and read too late into the night, that kind of thing. I, As a reader, I've always responded to that kind of story. I still do. So there's no real thought going into what does it mean to be a What does it take? What are the things I have to learn and do? It was just, yeah, I want to do that. And it was in my early 20s, I went to a writing workshop called the Clarion Writers Workshop, which is primarily focused on science fiction fantasy writers, and just got deluged with a lot of ideas about craft. Aren't those mind-blowing? I went so early in my journalism career, also I'd say in my late 20s, early 30s, I used to go to these things called the National Writers Workshop. Mm -hmm. They were all for journalism, and these Pulitzer Prize-winning feature writers and others would go, and I thought of them as celebrities in a way, and I wanted to pick their brain, like Rick Bragg of the New York Times. I was wondering, so you, at the Clarion, were there people who you had revered as writers or what exposed you to make you take this leap in your own craft? What I came out of that was very abstract. There was a six week course and each week there was a different instructor. And so there are different approaches, different ideas about what to do and how to do it. And it tended to be very much focused on rate of production and selling fiction, you know, about just the business of it. Which so many people are interested in, they want to know where the money is, right? Yes, exactly. And so that was interesting. I had not thought about it from that angle. And it was a crash course in a new perspective. I had, I was like, oh, that was my first inkling that I wasn't ready. Even amongst the people in that class, there was so much more awareness of the whole process amongst the, my, my colleagues than that I had. It was a little overwhelming. Not quite as much, though, about actual story, about writing about people, about, you know, the kinds of things that actually interested me as a writer. And so I left with very mixed feelings about it. I still have mixed feelings about it in workshops in general. And uh, I just wrote and sold one story, absorbing the, the more practical lessons I had to offer. And that's when I had that moment on the couch at my friend's house. I, my story was coming out. I was feeling very proud of myself and then read something real. And I was like, oh, I want to do more, something more in that vein. I don't want to just churn out stories just to write stories and make a paycheck every once in a while. In 2002 or three, I sold that short story, You Go Where It Takes You. And I sold a number of short stories. And then a book came out of that in 2013 called North American Lake Monsters. And that was quite well received. Right. And that How was did- all short stories. In 2013, when that came out and sold, already at that point, you're... How old was I? How old are you now? <laughs> I'm 52 now. So you were 42. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you, okay, early 40s. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's a relatively late yeah. age to have your first commercial success. What were you doing? Oh, I wouldn't call it a commercial success. But it, it was even then you wouldn't, even with the attention that you got and the sales that you got. No, the sales weren't through the roof. Okay. I got a lot of good attention. The sales were modest at best. Okay. What were you doing for a living? In 2013, I was waiting tables. Wow. Here in town? Here in town at the Biltmore Estate. The Biltmore Estate. Okay. Probably not bad tips there, I imagine. I was able to survive. That's great. So how did that change your trajectory, even though you said it wasn't life-changing in terms of financial reward, but you got some attention? How did that change your approach to what, how you saw your career in writing? It didn't really. I was so hyper-conscious of the fact that it was in my, I was in my 40s. I was very aware that it was a late start. And I'm a slow writer. It, I wrote those stories over a period of nearly 10 years. And, and when I sat down to start writing more stories, I still wasn't thinking of a novel at the time. You hear about musical artists, bands that have their entire lifetime to write their first record, then a, a year or two to write their next record. And, right. and it sounds like you were that way in, in itself, too. Your first book, your short story collection, spanned 10 years. And I imagine there was, you went through quite an arc in that time. The things sure. you were interested in writing about at the beginning of that time probably changed a lot toward the end. They changed after the book came out, weirdly enough. It was quite an arc. Many things happened. But I wasn't under contract to write a second novel. It was a small, independent press. Like I say, the sales were quite modest. The reviews I got were very good, but it wasn't like anybody was banging down my door for the next book. The stories you wrote at that beginning of that 10-year period, did they change markedly toward the end of that 10-year period? Were the things that interested you as a writer and the topics, the people, the tenor of your voice, the things you wanted to mine in your writing, had those changed a lot over those 10 years? Not over the course of 10 years. They did change, like I say, after the last story was finished. 
Because mm. I think even the, over the course of the, t those 10 years, even though they were individual stories, I had this notion of them as a as ultimately going to be in a book and as a kind of a cohesive work. I went back to the table and tried to write more stories and I found that I was trying to write stories in that vein because there was an anxiety about it. There's a sense of this is now who I am. I've gotten a little bit of recognition. I need to build on this. But the ideas and the interests were different now. I was trying to do something different. And for the first few stories that I wrote, I wanted to have more fun, really. I tended to draw more from my kind of like Pulp Fiction influences and just go a little a little more wild in, in the imaginative aspects of it. And so for the first few stories I wrote for the second book, I was anxiety ridden. I was like, oh, I'm just, I'm shooting myself in the foot. I'm making a terrible career decision. Why did you think that? Why, what was happening in the creative process, in the writing process of the second book that you didn't seem to be plagued with in your first collection? I think two things. One, I was more confident in my ability to do it. The first book was full of me just trying to prove to myself that I could do it. And the other thing is that I became less embarrassed about just embracing the things that I was, that I loved. It's even as a kid, yes, but even as an adult. Things like garish pulp fiction, comic books. But yet you said you had a burden with your second book that you weren't, didn't the first book. It seems like things yeah. flowed from you more easily. Do you think in some ways because you didn't have an agenda about it? In a way, you were just were writing these stories. And then when they got some success, maybe with your second book, you had the specter of that over your head a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there's definitely the idea that now people expect you to do something. And the fact that I was doing something different was part of that source of anxiety. Is they expect me to do something like that again. And it's going to be something completely, it's a different animal now. And uh, it's not entirely different. It's organically the same, coming from this, it's coming from the same tree, but it's... The flavor is very different. And so there was certainly that. And there was certainly the, the need to, uh, to please people. You want to make them happy. I got an agent halfway through the writing of the second book. The Overlook is going live, and you can be part of our very first live podcasting event. All record conversations with Asheville Symphony Orchestra music director Darko Buderitz and the local old-time Americana duo The Resonant Rogues, along with a special guest to be named later. The Overlook Live happens Wednesday, September 27th at the Wortham Center for the Performing Arts. Tickets will go fast once they're on sale to the general public, but anyone joining my Patreon campaign through June gets in free. Go to patreon.com slash the Overlook podcast to support the show now and secure your ticket for the Overlook Live. Did any of those earlier works, were they at all preludes thematically or approach to the strange? Yes, I think so. I think I, this goes back to what I said a few moments ago. I think they're all organically the same kind of story. They're just told at different points on a spectrum. The Strange also derives from my love of uh, old science fiction, old pulp. It draws heavily from M Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles, Isaac Asimov's I, Robot, Frank Herbert's Dune, Westerns. It's, I've come to this point where I just start, I feel much more comfortable just throwing in everything I love and letting it become what it wants to be. So yeah, those are all steps, I think, in, in, in getting to where I felt I could do this. I'm glad you said Westerns were in there too, because as I read The Strange, and I will tell you, I'm only into the fifth chapter right okay. now, but it jumped out to me that these kind of old pulpy Westerns combined with sci-fi, as I was reading this, it was interesting to me that you placed the time, and a lot of sci-fi, certainly interplanetary travel doesn't take place in the 1930s. And you're placing that, you're placing the earth we know, including the Negro League baseball, other factual elements of that era that we know of on earth. And you're placing that that is common knowledge to the people now living on Mars. Tell me why you decided to set this story in that time period when clearly we didn't have that kind of interplanetary travel going on, why not do something which I think would be both the easier route and the more understandable route to place it in the future, to even if the near future. But tell me about your thought process about putting this in the 1930s. Things like this don't come about as the result of conscious decisions, more often than not. More often they just, this is just what comes out of the cauldron. It's just 
emerges this way. I think one of the advantages I have from setting it in the past is that it is it more firmly establishes it, at least in my mind, as a fantasy novel, not a science fiction novel. This is there's not a single element of scientific plausibility anywhere in the entire book. It's fantasy. It just happens to be in a fantasy land that I'm calling Mars. It's a fantasy Mars. It's the old romantic wild Mars of my imagination when I was a kid. And that imagination was fed by stories by Edgar Rice Burroughs and Ray Bradbury. And 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 so the whole aesthetic of Mars, in my mind, is old. It's from the past. And two, I was reading a book around this time called The Worst Hard Time, which is about the Dust Bowl in, uh, in the 30s in America. That was a so, fantastic book. It was a great book. Yeah. And uh, and it fed it went into the cauldron. It was part of the it was part of the, uh, the soup, the stew that produced whatever came out of it. That's funny you say that. I don't want to interrupt. I want you to continue your thought. But when I, you were describing the winds and the landscape on Mars, I thought of the Dust Bowl. Yeah, yeah, I did too. So yeah, it's not really a. It's not like I, I'm sitting down there thinking, okay, what's the setting? What time period should I put this in? It's just I dipped the ladle in and I pulled it out, and that's what was there. The place came to me before the stories did. There was the idea of this abandoned town on old Mars, cut off from Earth. New Galveston. New Galveston. And uh, and they were faced with a life where they never find out what's wrong, what happened, but they just have to get on with it. And what is it like? What's it like for them now? How do they feel? Or what are their insecurities, what are their fears, how does it play out? And so that was the genesis of this story. Yes. Just that open question. And the original idea was going to be a kind of a more of a Thornton Wilder's Our Town sort of approach, where I would just take a, a kind of a more global look at this little town, and the various bumping off against each other. And I still like that idea. But, but then Annabelle's voice overrode everybody. So you didn't have Annabelle initially as a central character, per no. se. Not at all. So uh, just for listeners, Annabelle is a protagonist in this book, at least in the early going. I don't know what happens later on, but she certainly the, the narrative is told through her actions and experiences. You were mentioning about this isn't like a classic sci-fi story in a sense. You see it as more fantasy. I thought it was interesting, and I don't know if you were deliberate about this, but the you have these robots are called engines but they seem rudimentary. You get the sense as a reader that all the technology, whether it's the spaceships or the engines, they're all like first drafts, like that humanity will make great leaps in these in the future. You get that sense. Were you deliberate in making your technology seem almost antiquated to readers today? Yeah, it's, that was another decision that wasn't a conscious decision that just seemed appropriate. It just seemed like it fit the world. That wasn't conscious. That's really interesting. Yeah. So that that plays into, I imagine, how your writing works and how your mind works around this. Because everything, now these engines, one of the features of them is that the user, the human, has to change cylinders in the robot, physical cylinders that bring different voices, characteristics, personalities. Today, that wouldn't like be programs, the case. Pro programs, but it would be baked into the computer now, right. today. So you made it a very physical interaction. I, and I thought that was a beautiful gesture to the era. Even though it's the 1930s, those things did not exist. Yet I can imagine in my mind how big these look, how old tube amps or cords. I just imagine that were you, do you get visual images in your head as you're crafting these? Yes. I'm a very visual thinker when it comes to writing. And I think the kind of thing that you're talking about comes about from just steeping yourself in the mindset. I spent so long thinking about the perspectives of these characters and who they were and what the world felt like and looked like and smelled like. That when you do that for a while, and this is true of longer short stories too, like novellas, in my experience, it just changes like the settings, the dials in your imagination. And so that even the metaphors that you're coming up with on the fly as you're writing are metaphors that are appropriate to the setting. If it's a nautical story, then th those kinds of metaphors are what your brain offers to you. And, and here, like I say, I didn't think these robots have to be old and more and more rudimentary, as you say. It's just... That was the world I was living in, and so that's what my mind was offering me. And I think uh, the magic of it, for lack of a better word, once you just steep yourself in that place, your subconscious will tune itself to that. And the thoughts that you start getting and the language that you start using will already be calibrated to that, set, that, that, that kind of place. So you're not 
outlining your characters, no. really. You're not. You're just discovering them as you go. Absolutely. You also just said a little bit ago that you're a very slow writer. Does that mean that you're not just writing a wild draft and then editing intensely and then more and more revision and more editing. Is that the slowness or are you meticulous line by line until you've got it? That is a thing that changes. There's a kind of like a spectrum a back and forth that I'll go over. I've gotten to the point now where I'm more comfortable with sloppy drafts and just charging ahead and then going back and editing. I used to be someone who had to get every line right. I don't think one is better than the other. I think there are different strategies for getting to the final product. And I had to increase my pace. And it wasn't as if I was, like sometimes I take eight or nine months to write a short story. And it wasn't as if I was sitting down every day polishing every syllable of every word. That's That wasn't what I was doing. I would just sit and let my subconscious sit on it for two or three months. Then I'll sit down, I would sit down and write a few thousand words. Then I would sit on it for another two or three months. It was, the stories were good. I got good stories that way, but it's not a way to have any kind of career. By necessity, it seems like, you changed your process to throw words on the page, just get things out there, and then revise. It was a question of trusting myself. The whole, uh, this whole arc of my development has been just learning to trust myself more, to trust my instincts, to trust my imagination, to trust the subconscious, and not think that if I don't get it right now, it's never going to be right. It's, it will be right because you'll go back. And it's, it's almost like a collaboration with different versions of yourself. You put down this sloppy first draft. Then you come back at it, to it again later. And it's like it's you again, but it's, it's almost as if your past self has given you this thing. Here's this clumsy thing. Now you get a chance to try to make it work, make it better, and extrapolate on what's here. And so that's how I've come to think about it. When uh, you come back to it, is this weeks later, even months later? Once I sold it before it was finished. Once that happened, and all of a sudden there was someone who was waiting for it, and there was a whole apparatus waiting to be kicked into motion once this manuscript was delivered, then I was like, well, I can't do that anymore. It's now it's time to, to be more aggressive in its composition. And, and that's when I started changing the process. And the anxiety in the beginning was, oh, if I change my process, the stories are not going to be any good anymore. And yeah. that's just not the case. It's, a, it's an excuse we give ourselves, I think, to avoid doing real work. When you talked about the genesis of The Strange, you have two major elements that you take your time unearthing and telling readers what they are. One of them is the silence, and the other is the strange. So the silence and the strange. And you've just described where I'm at in the book, the strange. You have not described yet the silence. And I'm wondering, is this a deliberate element on your part to give readers breadcrumbs of information that are deliberately partial to keep the reader engaged to know that they will get answers to that down the road. <laughs> Deliberate is not the word I would choose because the way I want to tell stories like this is, especially when it's a first person narrative, you are dealing with characters who already know everything. This is all stuff that is understood in the world they're living in. And so they're not going to stand around talking to each other about the specifics and the history of what's going on, because I already know it. And so I wanted to write in that world and make it feel lived in, make it feel like this is all understood by the community and write them engaging with each other in that way. And so when you re reveal things, it's you do it piecemeal because the reader has to know certain things. The reader does not have to know everything and not all questions get answered. And that's intentional because in life, we have to accept the fact that we're steeped in mystery, and it will remain that way for our whole lives. But still, the reader has to know some things, so you try to, re you try to reveal them naturally and organically in the narrative so that you're not feeling, the reader doesn't feel bludgeoned by a big text of, of information. And some of that is just instinctive. The way that's paced, the way that's, the way that's parceled out, is not a thing that I plot out or, or plan. It's just, it's organic. It just comes naturally in the writing process. This is told in the first person, and Annabelle, she's a young girl. Yep. How did you embody the voice and mindset of a young girl? I don't really have a lot of anxiety about, about writing from different gender perspectives. I think there's a, there's a kind of a foundational kind of bedrock human experience that we all share that I feel comfortable drawing from. Also, she was 14. I think that's, that's, that's young enough, too, that more specific experiences really haven't branched out yet. 
And uh, I'm a father of a kid. I was 14 once myself. My daughter, when I first had this idea, was about 12, 13, 14, in that neighborhood anyway. I just pay attention. And I think that's what a writer needs to do, no matter what they're writing. That's the foundational rule is just pay attention. Every story has its voice. In particular, this is a first-person narrative, so Annabelle has her voice. And there's just a question of letting it be what it wants to be and listening to it and transcribing, in a sense. When you get into a character's head and they start talking, their voice develops, and it's, hopefully it's a strong, solid voice that, with consistency. What are you working on right now? I'm working on a couple things, a couple of novellas, which are in sequence. About, I think of them as lunar gothics. They're also space-faring 1920s stories, a bit darker than The Strange is. And I'm working on a novel. The working title is Moon Country, about a man who kidnaps his son, his five-year-old son, and takes him on a road trip and, and has trouble distinguishing what's real and what's imaginary. You had success with a film being made about one of your works yeah. earlier. Is there any talk of that happening with The Strange? Nothing yet. There have been some nibbles of interest, but nothing has is, nothing is come, come from that yet, I hope. What else do you do with your life in this town when you're not writing? What keeps you going? I work at the local downtown Books and News, the used bookstore oh, here in town. Yeah. Okay. I'll be starting up at Malaprop's bookstore as well. So You're going to two-time? You're going to work at both stores? Yeah, it's the same owner, so <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not really two-timing. <laughs> okay. You ride a motorcycle? I do some, yeah. Is it just for in-town travel, or do you go on long treks? I go on some trips. That's my only vehicle. My daughter, who stays with me, has a car, so sometimes I have to use her car, but uh -huh. the bike is, my, is what I'm on 95% of the time. It's a Triumph Bonneville T120. I like to ride. I like to get up on the parkway and take yeah. long journeys, go roads I've never seen before, small back roads, discover what's here. And there's so much here that you never see traveling the highways. I'd love to put a book together someday just about riding, a series of essays maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure what that'll look like yet. I want to thank my guest today, novelist Nathan Ballengrud. Today's conversation happened inside the BB Theater in downtown Asheville, which owners Susan and Giles Collard have been so gracious enough to open to me to record my interviews. Our theme music for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes courtesy of the Asheville band The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes are online by 6 a.m. every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at podavl.com. And please support the show by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. I'm Matt Pikin, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook.